It's 420 somewhere, but it is always 420 right here on the Cannabis Show. So hello and welcome. I am producer Vince, and over here is your host, Ricardo Baca. <laughs> Thank you, producer Vince, and thanks to everybody watching us at home at thecannabis.co and listening to the podcast. Uh, we appreciate you all tuning in. And now, you know what, Vince? What's up, Ricardo? <laughs> we have so much to talk about today. We have to get to our guests that I am just going to jump right into this week's marijuana news. Let's do it. Wow, last week we were buried in weed news. I feel like this week was just a little dry. <laughs> uh, it's true. It's a little bit dry. Uh, there weren't as many massive national stories. Uh, but this week did give us a major milestone for legal cannabis in America. Yeah, and it's back up in the Pacific Northwest again. Last week we were talking about Oregon, and this week we're talking about... Washington, of course. <laughs> Now, on July 8th, Vince, legal marijuana sales in Washington state celebrated their first birthday. And the state's pop program, it's grown so, so much in that last year. Seriously, Ricardo, I remember July 8th, 2014, when there was only one pot shop in Seattle. There was a couple of others scattered around that large state. <laughs> one <laughs> shop in Seattle. It seems like so long ago, but it was a year ago. And now the state has more than 160 shops and pot tax revenues. They're soared well beyond expectations. Um, the state's overall sales haul for legal weed topped $250 million. And its marijuana taxes totaled more than $70 million. That is legitimate money for the state. But at the same time, uh, it's a drop in the bucket when compared to Washington's two-year budget operating budget of $38 billion. I hear that, Ricardo, but how did Washington State's, uh, how did their pot sales do compared to right here in Colorado? Uh, you know, Colorado sold more than $313 million in recreational cannabis in its first year, um, and $700 million in total pot sales, but that number includes Colorado's regulated medical sales. So in Washington, the medical system was unregulated for the entire first year of the state's recreational era, so so let's say Washington sold $250 million in its first year, and Colorado sold $313 million in its first year. Well, that's pretty comparable. I'll Indeed. Yeah, very comparable. <laughs> uh, and now in other weed news events, let's move along. The cannabis-friendly ranch resort that captured an entire country's imagination in the last month <laughs> is calling uncle. Vince, do you remember Canna Camp? Of course I do. We can't <laughs> get away from the displays. We've talked about it so much on the show go check it out in the last couple of episodes it was even featured on jimmy fallon conan o'brien <laughs> that is the one and and after all that talk and all of those promises of 170 acres of wilderness and weed yoga and all around 420 friendliness canna camp is no more at least not this year. Um, so after publicizing a July 1 opening date, some of CannaCamp's organizers finally released the news that they were postponing the marijuana ranch to summer 2016. You know, I knew that it was too good to be true. <laughs> what about all the people who made reservations? <laughs> so the Mary Jane group said their partners failed to secure the ranch outside of Durango, Colorado. So now they've parted ways with those partners and they're looking for a new new location to open up next summer. Uh, for those who already made reservations, the Mary Jane Group is offering them a free stay at their 420 friendly B&Bs in Denver and Colorado Springs, Silverthorne, with the hopes that they'll rebook at Canna Camp when it finally opens next year. Um, so I had a long conversation with Joel Schneider of the Mary Jane Group, and he said he's, quote, disappointed and embarrassed. Yeah, no shit. I'd be embarrassed too if my weed <laughs> ranch was all over national TV and had to postpone its opening literally at the last minute, dude. Yeah, Yikes. yeah definitely. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not ideal. But Vince, it is time to welcome today's first guest. And he is legitimately one of the biggest names in modern marijuana reform, as he was one of the primary authors of Colorado's pot legalizing Amendment 64. Uh, he's since moved on to legalization measures measures in other states, as well as some battles right here in Denver, too. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Mason Tavert to The Cannabis Show. 
Mason, how's it going? It's going well, thank you for having me. Ah, pleasure. My pleasure, thanks for joining us. Oh yeah, absolutely. You have been a busy man lately, holy <laughs> hell. And I've been busy writing about it. Why don't we start by you briefly telling us about your current quest for the legal consumption of marijuana in businesses like bars and clubs in Denver? Sure, well, uh, the backers of Amendment 64 are proposing a measure for this November's ballot here in Denver that would simply allow for the limited social use of marijuana by adults in commercial establishments that want to allow it. So if a bar or a venue or an art gallery would like to limit it's, it's business to adults 21 and older, or if they have an area that is restricted to adults 21 and older and not visible to the public and not visible to people under 21, they can allow adults to consume marijuana as long as it's in compliance with the Clean Indoor Air Act. And you know, that's really what was intended here, was to let cities adopt these kinds of measures. And, and tell me, I mean, why is this necessary? We've talked a lot about public consumption on this show, uh, a lot about the absence of places that people can smoke outside of a private private residence. So I'm guessing that's the thrust behind this measure. Yeah, you know, for the same reason that, that people enjoy having a beer or, or a glass of wine, sometimes prefer to do it in places other than in a home. Uh, they like to go out and be social <laughs> and be among other adults who enjoy. I hear these bars you know, are quite yeah, popular. Yeah, yeah <laughs> these, these types of places. Um, you know, we think that adults who choose to use marijuana should be treated the same way. And we didn't want to have a separate but equal system with only marijuana bars and only alcohol. We just wanted to allow adults who choose to, to use marijuana if the establishment allows it. So uh, really, there's there's two things. Number one is just a matter of, of good policy and fairness and letting adults who can legally use marijuana do so in these types of places but number two for people who are visiting Denver who can legally purchase marijuana we need a place for them to use it uh, we don't want them to be using it in the park or on the street uh, or another public area but if they can't use it in their hotel room where are they supposed to go and so we need to give people a, a venue where they can go and and it will be acceptable and, and not visible to the rest of the public let's talk about the initiative if this passes um, people will be able to smoke pot on a rooftop of a bar so they have a rooftop patio and if that rooftop patio is out of sight they can smoke pot up there under this initiative what about vaping eating edibles can they do that kind of stuff inside the bar if the owner is okay with it yeah so marijuana falls under the clean indoor air act so that means that smoking indoors is not allowed so vaporizing or other non-smokable forms of marijuana consumption would be allowed inside and then outside in areas where smoking is currently allowed for tobacco and so on adults would be to use marijuana as long as it's not visible as you said so it's even a little more restrictive than it would be for smoking you know other substances that are far more harmful to people but uh, really we just want to make sure that we're we're you know opening this up and letting adults consume marijuana responsibly in places that choose to allow it and 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 I've not thought about this until now but where would like dabbing fall under would that be something that could be done indoors or outdoors it's kind of a, uh, a vapor well, I don't know. as far as I'm aware dabbing generally involves combusting very you know uh, fire if you will sure. um, in okay. large part uh, so I would think that that would generally be considered smoking uh, so for the same reason that I'm sure that you couldn't you know, dab tobacco in a in a bar currently, I bet you uh, will not be able to do so with marijuana. But uh, really what we're looking at primarily are gonna be people who choose to vaporize marijuana and, and uh, people who might choose to smoke outdoors. Um, you know, you were kind enough to work with us on, a, on an exclusive with the new polling data um, that you guys uh, commissioned from a reputable organization. And it showed some fascinating statistics. Uh, I, I want you to tell us about this polling data because it just kind of shows that this shift in public opinion, but also um, the city of Denver, it seems like voters here do believe that there is a need for for some sort of consumption outside of private residences. Yeah, you know, Denver voters have repeatedly said that they think marijuana should generally be treated similarly to alcohol. And so part of that would include allowing adults to use it socially in, in these types of, uh, of establishments. Uh, we found uh, a public policy polling, which is usually the most uh, accurate pollster when it comes to marijuana-related issues, uh, they found 56% of likely 2015 Denver voters support this measure. They think that it should pass. And they also, what was really interesting, found that by more than a four to one margin, Denver voters recognize that alcohol is far more problematic than marijuana here in the city. And you know, anyone who walks down Colfax Avenue or 
is in Lodo on a weekend <laughs> knows this, We've but all been uh, there. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, it's really good to see that people are starting to really recognize the actual potential harms associated with these substances. Neither is entirely harmless, but we really need people to understand the relative harms, and it's just a fact that marijuana is substantially less harmful. Fascinating, and it's definitely something we're going to return to uh, later on in the program. But uh, first, I want to switch gears. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your finger on the pulse of like national marijuana policy in a way that most people simply don't. So can you just kind of shed a light on November 2016? What are we looking at? What are we, who's going to be voting? Do you know all the states yet who would definitely be voting on legalization in November 2016? Well, the one that we absolutely know is going to be is Nevada, where an initiative is on the ballot for November that, uh, November 16, that would be similar to Colorado's law in Washington, Oregon, simply regulating and uh, the production and sale of marijuana for adults. For recreational purposes. Yep, yeah. so uh, that would be in Nevada. That's already on the ballot. And then we for are- For 16. For 16. Okay. And then we're currently uh, supporting petition drives for similar initiatives in Arizona and Maine. And we fully expect those to qualify for the ballot for 16 as well. And we're in the process uh, with a lot of our coalition partners of drafting initiatives for California and Massachusetts. And we fully expect those to make it on the ballot for 16. And then there are also a couple other states where some activists are talking about putting measures on the ballot. Uh, we're not as involved in those, so I can't really speak as certainly about those as I, as I can about uh, the ones that we are working on. But uh, there are folks in Michigan, there are some folks in Ohio, there are uh, uh, Ohio. Folks in, in uh, <laughs> Florida looking at medical marijuana, Missouri, where they're looking at adult use. Uh, so there's a lot going on. And then, of course, there's also really a lot of, of, of action in legislatures, too. Interesting. Interesting. Um, you and I, in passing in, in the last year, have talked about Maine, I believe. And, mm -hmm. and you've said in the past, and I'd love for you to talk about it on the program, but um, Maine, in many ways, somewhat resembles Colorado and how Colorado's march toward recreational legalization. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, how the two states might share some things in common? Well, yeah, Maine is really, it appears, based on, on what's been going on over the last couple of years, to be where, Den where, where, where where Colorado is now. So by that I mean back in uh, 2005 when we ran the first initiative in Denver to make marijuana possession legal for adults, it received about 53.5% or so. Uh, then in 2012, about 67% of Denver voted to legalize marijuana for adults. Now. In Maine, we ran a measure in Portland, which is, like Denver, the largest city in that state, and they received 67% on wow. that initiative last year, two years ago at this point. Uh, so it's almost like the largest city in, in Colorado was at 67% when we passed our legalization initiative statewide. That's where the largest city in Maine is, if it's not higher at this point. Uh, we've also since passed another local initiative in Maine, uh, in, in the city of South Portland. Uh, we also had a pretty solid showing in Lewiston, although it fell a little short. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been a very solid discussion about marijuana, and particularly about the relative safety of marijuana compared to alcohol. And that's also a similarity. Uh, uh, the organizer out there uh, who, who lives in Maine and has been working on this for the last several years has done a great job of, of, of fostering that conversation. Is there a chance that Maine will be the first state on the eastern seaboard to legalize it? Well, it'll likely be uh, between Maine and Massachusetts if it goes till 16, but we're really pulling for Rhode Island, which could still be this year. Rhode Island's uh, measure is in the legislature. It's still on the table. They recessed, so that'll come up in the fall. Uh, Vermont is the other big one, and both those states could very possibly pass a measure before November 16, but if they don't, then we ex expect Maine and, and Massachusetts will. Uh, the action in legislatures is fascinating to watch, and I'm yeah. sure uh, it's equally fascinating to you. Mason, thanks for joining yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, my next guest, I've asked Vince to pull a couple images so you can see her handiwork, and that's the popular Kitchen Kush staple can of butter right there, and there's a veggie tart, oh, and some hummus. God, that looks delicious. Check out this trifle. 
All right, Vince, thank you for doing that. My next guest is an incredibly talented chef and a devoted marijuana enthusiast. And if you've ever read any of our food coverage and recipes at The Cannabis, you're already familiar with Lori Wolf's work. It's my pleasure to welcome Lori to The Cannabis Show. How's it going, Lori? Really good. Oh, you're bringing up a friend, too. Um, All right. This is my buddy, Nikon. Nikon. He, he goes everywhere with me. Therapy dog, it says there right <laughs> yeah, on his harness. Yeah. Um, it's Nikon. great to be here in Denver. I know. Welcome. Laura, you're Thank from Portland, you. and I, yeah. that's the first thing I want to talk about. You've been legal for a week. Yeah, Does it's it, amazing. Does Oregon sh feel, look any different, same old Portland? Well, actually, for the week that it's been legal, we've been in Denver. Uh, oh, <laughs> which wow. Is, you okay, know, sure. Um, but it's been pretty fabulous. I was there for the first couple of days, and people are thrilled. It's going to be a while before things actually change. Uh, I can now share my edibles with friends, you know, without right. worry. But in October, it seems that it will be legal for people to go into medical dispensaries and purchase flour. Yeah. Edibles are going to take a while longer. Yeah, interesting things going on with edibles in Oregon. Uh, and I do want to talk to you about this kind of no man's land that, that Oregon's in right now because you can absolutely possess and ingest and grow and share, as you said. Yeah. But you can't buy, and more Oregonians than ever are now turning to the, uh, you know, the northern market, going up to Vancouver, Washington. Uh, but I want to know about you, your friends and family, and, and, and other Oregons. Where are you guys getting your weed? now that it's legal to own but not necessarily buy well fortunately marijuana medical marijuana has been legal for quite some time sure so it, it turns out that just about everybody I talk to has a plant or two <laughs> in their house um, so it has been relatively easy to get marijuana and I have friends who have crossed the border but it is still not legal federally and you know as much as i love orange is the new black i just didn't feel like spending any time in prison um but there's superb marijuana and you know i it, it hasn't been a problem for people There's to get their hands of it. Plenty, okay. plenty. Have you ever done the thing, popping over into Washington, grabbing some weed, and, and coming back? It seems like many police throughout the state of Oregon are fine with it, even if it is in direct conflict with the <laughs> yeah. de Department of Justice memo. Well, what we actually did, my business partner Mary and I went to Seattle and we purchased marijuana there mm -hmm. and made canna oil and canna butter so that we could enter two of our products in the Seattle Dope Cup. Sure. And we won first prize and second prize. It was really awesome. Congratulations. But before that, thank you, thank you. We never, I never did um, take it over the border. Just All right. a little nervous about that uh, i get it i get it nobody wants to end up in the orange is the new black as yeah, you said yeah and you know we drove here from oregon and huh, i like had the bags and like do i put them in the car do i not do i you know because i wanted you and you know people here to try but i was like no <laughs> from what i understand idaho um they're like looking for the people going through and there has just, been some uh, license plate profiling yeah, going uh, on yeah. yeah so we've kind of played it safe <laughs> i think that's smart decision yeah. um, and laura i have to tell you every time i see that famous cookbook uh, the joy of cooking i think of you because uh, laura you put so much passion into your oh, recipes you. Uh, you, there's videos that go along with every single recipe that you write on the cannabis but i want you to tell us about your favorite weed recipe Ever, well, whether you've written it for us or somebody else, I, it may be the puff pastry tart that you sure. show. Oh yeah, the, the vegetable puff yeah. pastry. Yeah, okay, yeah, cool. with it, goat cheese, mm -hmm. and I think that I love. Like everybody's kind of familiar with the sweet yeah. edibles, but I love the idea of starting a meal with a medicated or infused product, so that when you get to dessert. It's kind of just starting to kick in. Right. And I like just love sitting at a table with people and they're all like, oh, yeah, you know, I feel it now. And then when you get the dessert, it just tastes amazing. So although I love making everything, I kind of love the appetizer or derby things. I think that makes the most sense, too, because, you know, as much as, you know, sweets do really lend themselves to being infused with cannabis. Um, 
you know, by the time you get there, you're wrapping up a meal, you're yeah. wrapping up a night. Eventually, you're going to be going to bed at some point. So why not start, start your meal it. experience with it and then move on and let the food kind of inform and power exactly. the high? Yes. Now, which, Mary and I are doing a dinner um, in a couple of weeks, and we're going to start with a infused tart with a sativa and we're going to end with an indica oh my gosh so you know won't be crazy strong yeah good. but that seemed like the way you know <laughs> we're going to try that that seems like the way to go i like it it makes sense thank you thank you um, i want to bring mason back into the conversation so this is a question for both of you um now we were talking about the poll earlier and mason mentioned that one of the findings in this poll is that people in denver think by a four to one margin that marijuana causes fewer problems than alcohol. Um, Mason and Lori, this is for both of you. What is one thing that has changed in the last year to kind of make for such a dramatic change in public opinion? Uh, you know, that's, I, I would venture to say that maybe that, that statistic wouldn't exist for Denver uh, one or two years ago. So Mason, what do you think is one thing that's contributed to that switch? Well, the establishment of the cannabis, of course. <laughs> uh, Good answer. Uh, I, I, but I, I, I do honestly believe that it has been the public dialogue that's surrounded this issue, and, and that's really, you know, driven by media coverage. And so, I, you know, the more people hear about it, the more people learn about it, the more news coverage there is about it. People talk to each other, and they start to hear that, you know, this isn't the crazy, dangerous substance that you were told it is. It's actually less harmful than alcohol. And they start to recognize it, and that's really what it takes, is, is hearing from people you know who you trust mm -hmm. explaining you know listen this isn't this crazy you know like addictive psycho killer stuff you've Reefer heard about madness. you know it's it's it certainly has its potential for some harm especially for certain people but in large part it is far far less harmful than alcohol and and people are starting to recognize that and that's one thing i've long attributed to you mason because you were one of the first people i met when i got this job a couple of years ago and and i asked you some form of that question at the time and and when you said that it's just simple conversation around dinner tables and around the television and and that simple conversation is what's changing um, people's perception and and the overall acceptance of marijuana um, it kind of latched onto my brain in a way that I was like, oh, you're exactly right. It's that simple. It's not some crazy complex thing. It really comes down to a conversation between siblings or a son and his father around a dinner table or a fireplace or something. Lori, what's, what's, what's your take on this? One thing that's happened in the last year that has helped kind of switch public opinion. Sanjay Gupta. There you go. You know, I sure. think that people recognizing that marijuana is natural that it grows in the ground and that it has important medical properties that really i like for me i have a seizure disorder and once i started using cannabis it's gone like it has completely managed my health issue and i know a lot of people who are getting huge relief sure and not having to deal with the side effects of strong pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. um i think that that people are starting to think of it and as the country goes kind of in a more natural way and focus i think that people are thinking that this would be preferable to having to deal with the issues you know the the side effects side and effects things. yeah and seeing a respected doctor and journalist yeah. on one of the largest cable yeah. networks in in the world it, it has made significant impact and it in the certainly last year seems to yeah he released his third documentary yeah. weed three and he continues to kind of he's almost a star maker you know he's like anointing people now in the third documentary sue sisley who's doing a bunch of uh, research on ptsd and and cannabis um, um, you know, she's now bigger than she's ever been yeah. because of Weed 3. Yeah. Interesting point of view, and, and I can't disagree with either. Um, it is time, you guys. Lori's favorite part of the program. Oh, yeah. It's for... like taking me back to seventh grade. <laughs> it is. It's a pop <laughs> quiz. Only this time it's a little bit more fun because it's a pot quiz. Okay. Um, Lori, we're starting with you. Oh, no. Um, okay. And ultimately, if Lori gets the question wrong, Mason, you can steal the point. 
and vice versa. So, Lori, first question to you. Uh, due to safety concerns, the city of Aurora, Colorado is considering a limit on the total number of marijuana plants in each household. If the proposal passes, how many plants could you have in a single home in Aurora? I'm guessing here two. Two. Not quite. But good guess, good guess. Thank you, thank All you. All right, Mason? Twelve. Twelve. Mason has a little bit of an inside track on that, <laughs> but yes, it is twelve, yeah. and that is accurate. <laughs> that is points from Mason. Wow. Um, Mason, next question for you. A tech company this week made international headlines when it released plans to help marijuana growers by using what emerging technology? Holy cow. Hmm. This is kind of an odd one. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I do not know. Any guess? Uh, energy. Wind energy. Wind energy. Not quite. Not quite. Yeah. Good guess, though. Uh, Lori, you I have a thought? That was a clue. A little right. hint. <laughs> oh, no hints. Uh, <laughs> but, no idea. But the answer is 3D printing. Ah. They're 3D printing Whoa. these, um, you know, little uh, bowls and, and tops and little things that you can grow marijuana, and it's kind of open source technology. Um, it seems interesting. Yeah. Made headlines. I didn't. I, we didn't put it on the cannabis. I wasn't quite sold, but still fascinating. And that's why I didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too kind, Mason. Too kind. <laughs> All right, Laura, you're up next. Okay. City employees including some teachers in what recreational marijuana state were told recently that they could smoke marijuana on their own free time as long as they were not under the influence at work. So what, what recreational state is home to Alaska. Based? No. Oh, God. No. I really suck at this. <laughs> Oregon? Oregon! Oh, and how Lori. can that be? That's where I live. Oh, wow. You haven't been reading the Oregonian, Well, I've been on the road. Yeah, true, <laughs> true, true. true. <laughs> All right, Mason, finishing out strong. Illinois recently introduced a bill that would set a blood limit on how much THC a driver could have in their system while driving. If it passes, the amount would dwarf the five nanograms per milliliter uh, currently used in Colorado. Do you know what the level being proposed in Illinois is? Uh, How many nanograms per milliliter of blood? We're involved in this bill, so I should. Uh oh. Is it 30? No, it's not. Lori, for the steal. 50? 50? Oh, man. You wish, Lori. You wish it was 50 <laughs> nanograms per milliliter. <laughs> You'd be moving to Chicago. I would. <laughs> it is 15. Uh, 15 nanograms. Okay. Uh, controversial out in Illinois, but it's interesting because a lot of people are starting to recognize that the 5 nanogram per milliliter limit in Colorado and Washington is an yeah. imperfect number. Huh. Mason, your thoughts on 5 nanograms? Oh, well, you know, yeah, five nanograms are far too many people who are found to not be impaired who, who might have five nanograms in their system. So it's, it's clearly an unfair system. We need to have laws that ensure only people who are actually impaired are being punished. So, right. Yeah. yeah. But that's actually an, an element of the decriminalization bill, I believe, uh, that's tied to the decriminalization bill that's currently on Governor Rauner's desk out there in Illinois. Absolutely, so, it is, yeah. yeah. Which is the far more fun and exciting part of that law. <laughs> uh, well, Mason, Lori, I'm so thrilled to have you both on the, and in Nikon, have you, all three of you on the couch. Um, thanks again to our friends at home for joining us. Thanks again to Mason, to Vert, and Lori Wolf. I'm Ricardo Baca, that is producer Vince, and Dane, Katie, the whole crew. Have a great day, everyone, and we will see you next week. Ain't afraid to get in. I be going for the jackpot with aces in my hand. I'm raw.